Hello Life Changers, thank you so much for joining us. We have got an amazing sermon for you, so why don't you lean in, grab a notebook, grab a pen, and get ready to hear of the more that God has for us. My name is Gabe Phillips, and it's a huge privilege to be with you and preaching this morning. There are a whole bunch of different phrases that uh, I think if I start to say them, I just have to get halfway through, and I think without skipping a beat, you will just click into memory mode and you'll be able to finish them. Any Shakespeare fans out there, the the bard himself says, to be or not to be, that is the question. Very good, people. Wow, for this early in the morning, very good. You'll hear uh, the the Pinterest or Instagram classic says, when life gives you lemonades. (laughs) When life, let's just try that again, people, again, early in the morning. When life gives you lemon, you make lemonade. Very good, very good. Or, or I know some, some of you might not want to shout this out because it'll give, give away your age or give away your leaning in life. When you hear the, the great poets of our time start to, Bob Marley start to sing, Don't worry about a thing. There we go. Very, very good, you know. Or maybe like the, the, the most, most classic 90s phrase of our, of our generation. We just know it. Like sands through the hourglass. These are the days of our lives. For me, the, more close to home, the phrase is this. Whenever I hear the word, Dad, and we're at the shops, I know it's not a, a, a word of affection. It's a word of please, saying, Dad, can we have an ice cream? <laughs> That's the phrase for me at our home. But it's these phrases, these phrases that we just start to say, and they just they roll off the tongue because they become so entwined with our culture. We know the finishing point. And likewise, in the Bible, there's a certain phrase that gets said so many times, 80 times, plus, plus 80 times in the New Testament alone, when Jesus himself will say these words, the kingdom of God is like. And he would say this phrase, and, and people would almost they would have this anticipation, expectation of what they thought the kingdom of God would be like. But actually, where we would be able to sing those songs or those lines in unison, the, the people around Jesus' time would be able to fill that in that blank with different phrases because they all came with different expectations, different backgrounds, different ideas of what the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven would be like. You see, they had been waiting for a Messiah for a long time. They'd been longing for the Messiah to come. When Jesus steps into the, the fray there in, in, in Israel at that time, the people had been waiting for, for generations, for years, for centuries, for the Messiah that would come, that would lead them back into the promised land. One who, a greater Moses, one, a greater David, a greater Nehemiah in Israel. Somebody who would come and who had, they'd once been rescued from the Egyptians. They'd once been restored back to their land from the Babylonians. And now they're under the oppression of the Roman government and a, a Roman rule and the Pharisees and, and this, this regime, this oppressive regime and they're waiting for the Messiah who would come and restore the kingdom back to Israel. So for them, they had all this vivid imagery of what it's like. And it's amazing when we think about it, if you had polled the people in those those days, they would have probably leant in different directions. They would have thought, we're longing for a people's Messiah. In the sense of a Messiah who would come with the Roman government would say, "Give, give them bread and circuses to entertain them. Feed them and keep them entertained. The people would want, likewise, would want a government who would come and, and would feed them, who would supply their needs, who would, in a, so, in a social justice type sense, would come and bring uh, freedom to a people who have been oppressed, financially marginalized. They would maybe be hoping for a political savior, a political Messiah, who would come and restore them to their significance, give them a status that's beyond their, their groveling at the table of the Roman Empire. They wanted somebody to come and restore their fortunes back. We, we, when we were, were kings, when David ruled, we want somebody to come and take us back to those golden eras. Or maybe they were hoping just the zealots among them were just looking for a powerful Messiah, the one who would come and give them a military victory, someone who would ride in on a white horse and would slay the Roman oppressors who would take down the tax collectors the, and the regime that was against their flourishing. And actually, there was this cry in them that you would establish your kingdom so we could sit on the right hand and the left and we can rule and have authority again. And had all this imagination of what the kingdom of God would be like and the Messiah when he would come. And it's this incredible reality. It's almost like, what's it like? You can imagine on the dinner tables, kids, dad, mom, what's the kingdom of God going to be like? And they'd have all these incredible things. The kingdom of God will be like, and they would fill in the blank. But then Jesus comes. And after 12 chapters in Matthew, as he picks up scene, we get into chapter 13, where we're going to base our new series called What's It Like out of for the next five weeks. And he starts to tell a succession of parables. And it's incredible because these parables are explaining what the kingdom of God is like. In Matthew 13, there's seven successive parables where Jesus explains what's it like. Answering the question that had been on their hearts for centuries, what is it like? But then in Matthew 19 to 25, if you want to go read them later at home, 
you'll find about, in my account, another five specific parables what the kingdom of God will be like in the coming age. So these two types of parables that Jesus is teaching, he's teaching the parables what the kingdom of God is like now, that it's at hand. Repent, it is here. The kingdom of God has come. But then in in, in a quick response, he's then teaching later on what the kingdom of God will be like when God comes finally again in glory. And it's a reality we have to understand, and maybe this is a little bit teachy for for 9.30 in the morning, but we have to understand that the kingdom of God, what it is like for us here and now, and what is coming. You see, the reality is that we are living in a reality of the kingdom of God, that it is here, but it's not yet here. Does that even make sense? <laughs> it's, it's, it's come, but it hasn't come in fullness. In the sense of, we really realize that when Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross, he bought the kingdom. He said, it is finished, it is done. The kingdom has come. Repent, the kingdom has come. But then we know that one day when, in the consummation of all ages, when God comes again in his glory, when Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead finally, then the kingdom will come in fullness. Does that even make sense? It's the reality for you and I that actually this is what we're living. We're living in between the times. We're living in between the cross of Calvary where it has come and the, the end of the age or the consummation of the ages. We're living in this age called the church age. We're living between the already and the not yet. And that's, and that's why we trust, and the kingdom is coming, it's breaking in, and one day it'll break in, in fullness. That's why I try, pray and know that people get healed, and people still get healed today. Praise the Lord. But also, people still don't get healed today. But I wait for the full healing when the kingdom comes in fullness. And I live in between the tension, not giving, leaning to one way or the other, but knowing that actually he is good, he is God, the kingdom has come. And the best description of this that has helped my finite brain understand this, and this is for the history buffs out there, there was something called D-Day. At the end of World War II uh, in, in Normandy, on the beaches of Normandy, the June the 6th, 1944 to be exact, was the time when the Allied forces finally put to death the end of the, they, they repelled, they took the beach of Normandy and they repelled finally the, 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 the German Third Reich, the Nazi forces. And D-Day, victory was declared. Victory has been won. But then for the next 11 months, as Hitler started to run and people had started to, the, the bunkers started to go erupt with chaos and all the theories happened. What happened in the bunker there? And crazy things started to go on. For the next 11 months, as the army started to uh, pull back from the front forces, there were still skirmishes going on. And it was only 11 months later, on the 8th of May, 1945, where we get VE Day, Victory Day, when the, 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 the surrender was signed in writing, and Germany seceded and said, we're done, we're out the war. In a sense, victory was declared. But then there was 11 months of fighting, and still, of still finishing this battle as people pulled, the enemy forces pulled back, as the kingdom of the Allied moved forward and forcefully advanced, and then victory was finally won a year later. That, if you want to know where we are at, we're in this section, that 11 months, victory has been declared and won, but now we're waiting for the fullness of our salvation to come, and we're in that era, pushing back the force of darkness, who are retreating, because the gates of hell cannot prevail, but we are in that world, and, and, and you know, this is an incredible reality, as the great, uh, in, in the heights of slavery, the great African songwriters and in, 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 the modern, in modern America would write, they write this, this phrase, this refrain, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And it's the reality in the sense of the narrative of Jesus' death and then resurrection on the cross. It's Friday. He's died, and we believe that. But, but Sunday is coming. We know there's fullness coming. There's resurrection power coming. There's life coming. When all, will, all every tear will be wiped away, all will be brought back into order and unison, and the lion will lie down with the lamb, and, and that day is coming. And maybe it feels like, I don't know about you, but it feels like for me, it's a lot of Fridays at the moment. Whether it's load shedding, whether it's lockdowns, whether it's pandemics, whether it's viruses, whether it's corruption, whether it's Ukraine and, and Russia, whether it's this new uh, theology, this idea, this, and, and we feel like there's a lot of skirmishes going on, but I don't want, don't lose heart. I want to tell you, in between life, where it feels like Friday, hospital visits, terrifying headlines, phone calls with bad news, depression, fears, anxieties, take heart, take heart, we will overcome, it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. We have to understand the kingdom of God. So I want to read a scripture, Matthew 13. We're going to look at Matthew 13 as we understand what it's like for the next few weeks. And I'm going to take the first parable, Matthew 13, verse 1 to 23. This is what it says. Later, the same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him. So he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables such as this one. Listen. 
I love how the parable starts. It starts with Jesus saying, listen, he who has ears, hear. And a quick refrain I want to remind us is stop asking God to speak and maybe just start listening. Because God is speaking. God is speaking. Just want to wonder, are we listening? Anyway, that's an aside. Listen, Jesus says. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as it had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Simple, hey? Well, let's keep reading, because his disciples didn't think so. His disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Jesus replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Simple, but it's also secretive. But others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and the ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their ears cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. It's simple, it's secretive, but it also seems like it's subversive. Jesus is saying this thing is turning it on upside down. It is, he's inviting, saying the people who thought they were in are going to be out. And the people who thought they're out are going to be in. He said that this is the incredible understanding, the upside down nature of the kingdom. It's the weak made strong. It's the humble exalted. It's the last becoming first. It's the servants becoming the greatest. The kingdom of God is totally different to what they had expected. Let's keep reading. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as being planted. I love it. Jesus basically preaches a great sermon. Amen. Let's go home. But this is an incredible reality. If just imagine the scene. Everyone's gathering around. There's this anticipation, excitement. They've longed for a Messiah. They've filled in the blank of what the kingdom of God will look like when it comes. They've, they've longed for it. They thought when we'll get significance, when we'll get right standing, when we'll see freedom come into our world. They've longed for this. And then Jesus comes and he starts to do signs and wonders and miracles. And he's causing a stir. The, the, the elite are freaking out. And everyone's coming. They're gathered around him. And he pushes out of shore on a boat and says, I want to tell you what the kingdom of God is like. And they all hang on every word he says. They're like, he's going to say it. Get your notepads out. Take your selfies out. This is the day. He's going to describe what the kingdom of God is like. And I can imagine they would have gone, oh, he's going to tell us the kingdom of God is like an army. Oh, that's going to be good. Those Romans, they're going to get it. Tell us, Jesus. Unleash us. He's he's going to tell us the the kingdom of God is like an elite fighting squadron. And then we're going to go. He's going to say the kingdom of God is like Wakanda. Wakanda. It's going to be like the Avengers in in the incredible reality against Thanos. Come on, bring in Iron Man. Here we go. The kingdom of God is like, and Jesus says, it's like a farmer, seeds, and soil. And they're like, no, what are you talking about? And in this moment, you can feel a crashing sense of disappointment. I, I would. When I first read it, I'm like, that's it? That's what we've been building up to? Soil, seeds, and a farmer. Jesus is saying, no, I want to tell you, the kingdom of God is not in the political arena. 
It doesn't start there. It's not starting in the religious temples. It's not starting in the elitist boardrooms. It's not in the sky waiting for it one day when it will come down. Whoa, there we go. Jesus starts off by saying the kingdom of God, it's in the dirt. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. It's in the dirt. So I want you to tell the person next to you that the kingdom of God is like and say to him, it's in the dirt. Three, two, one. Why don't you do that? Let's pray briefly. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. I thank you that he who has ears would hear what the Spirit of God is saying to his church. And we also thank you, God, for the Springbok win yesterday. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. So we, re- we see this narrative. Those gathered around the boat. They're longing for Jesus to say something about Rome. Say something about the tax collectors. Say something about the sinners. Let's be honest, not too far in what the church is saying these days. Jesus, say something about that political situation. Jesus, say something about that religious mess up. Say something about that vile sin in the world. That's what the church need to be talking about now. And Jesus goes, nah, I want to tell you, the kingdom of God, I want to teach you a kingdom principle, something different than this world. Because my kingdom is not of this world. And Jesus starts off introducing this notion of the kingdom of God is like by telling them a principle called sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. And it's this reality because in this world, our economy of this world is buying and selling. The economies of this world is hustling and maneuvering. The economy of this world is arguing and posturing on social media, trying to be on the front foot and the right, make sure you're on the right side of history, the right side of the argument. When actually the Bible tells us that actually the kingdom of God's economy is sowing and reaping. And it's the total antithesis of the world. And I want to just remind us at this juncture, maybe from our own heart, and you keep saying this and again and again, but our security and our future as the people of God, as business people, as parents, as people fearing for what is the future for our kids, for what is going on in your own heart, let me tell you, our future and security is not tied up in the economies and philosophies of this world. My future is not dictated to by Ukraine and Russia and the resolve of that. My future is not dictated to by COVID-19 and what happened there or what's going to happen. My future is not dictated to by petrol prices. Praise the Lord. My future is not tied to ESCOM or job sources. No, it is tied to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like, and we have to understand, it's like, not political power. No, it's not either religious maneuvering, and neither is it financial making you get on the right side of things. No, the kingdom of God is in the dirt, sowing and reaping. The people of God forget this too quickly. That's why Jesus is teaching it to us. And I want to tell us about sowing today, that the kingdom of God is like a whole bunch of seed. A whole bunch of seed right here. And the the incredible reality when we understand this is Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a farmer who sows some seed. And now there's a scripture that I love that haunts me and yet encourages me. I don't know if you've ever got those scriptures that do two things at once. It's Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 10. If you go read those whole three, four verses. But one line in particular says this. God will not be mocked. It says, you will reap what you sow. Other translation says, you will harvest what you plant. And I love that it encourages me because I know that actually God is faithful. It terrifies me because I know God is faithful. God will not be mocked. I will reap what I sow. I will harvest what I plant. And I want to encourage us simply at this moment, this time, maybe just to hearts in the, to bring into alignment a kingdom principle in our hearts to re- keep reminding us that this is the season. If you want to know what is the season, and you're saying prophetically, God, what are you doing? I want to tell you, this is what God is prophetically calling the church to do. Sow seed. Sow seed. No, but the, the economies are in the tank. No, but you don't know the financial future. Oh my gosh, have you seen what's going on? Biden and Trump and oh, the chaos that's going. Sow seed. Sow seed. Sow seed. It is time for us to be people who sow into the word, not sow into conspiracies. Because you will reap what you sow. Sow into the word of God. Sow. Sow invest in the word of God. Sow in the spirit. Sow in prayer. I want to tell you, this is the time. If you're saying, well, how do I find courage for my marriage? Let me tell you, counseling is good. Community is good. But here's a great thing for you as an individual. Sow in prayer. God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. Pray for your spouse. I thank God for my mom and my dad. They have many weaknesses, many flaws. Hi, mom and dad, if they watch this later. And they'll tell you them, but I tell you one strength of my parents is they have been praying parents. And we lost a lot in Zimbabwe, and my dad always jokes, uh, inheritance-wise, there's not much coming my way. 
But I thank God that my future is not tied to the inheritance of this world, but there's an inheritance that's been sowed up in prayer that I am walking in already, but I know we'll have a greater harvest one day. My parents prayed for every one of my, my, the three Phillips boys' spouses. And let me tell you, if you've seen the wives of the Phillips boys, you know God has been faithful. <laughs> not just in looks, let me tell you. Well, but that's a bonus. But let me tell you, God has been so kind. And I want to tell you, when we get to heaven one day, I am, I am pretty much sure, because the economy of heaven is sowing and reaping, that the people who will get applause are the people who sowed. And I think people who sowed in prayer will, will, people will be amazed. You did what? The people who interceded behind closed doors and sowed because they trusted the principle that the kingdom of God is not out there, it's in the dirt. Would you keep sowing in prayer? Would you sow in tears? Because the Bible says you'll reap in joy. Sow in tears, sow in tears. Pour out your heart before and pour, f- weep for community, weep for people. I want to say sow in, in, into people. This is a time to still be sowing into people, investing into people, pouring yourself out into people. Sow in generosity, sow in prophetic words. You know, this church, Life Changes Century City, but Life Changes as a whole is here because 15 or so years ago, people were sowing prophetic words into a community that did not look like this community. A lily white community of 70, 80 people in table who, who did not own property, who had no standing in the, in, in, in the city, who had no ability to maneuver. Most of the people had moved down from Durban. You couldn't find a local Cape Tony anywhere. And yet, the Spirit of God said, actually, this is what I have for you. And people sowed prophetic words into a community, sowed them, sowed them, and not into this beautiful, high flying, amazing church. No, they sowed them into the dirt, the dirt of a community. And God says, I will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. I'll tell you, this is a time to sow. Again, let me tell you what my, I, I really have to, to refrain my preaching each week, whether it's to a large crowd or a small crowd, that actually, God, I will be faithful to preach your word. Because preaching is not entertaining. Preaching is sowing. Sowing. I tell you every week, and I tell you, there's prep in my heart where I prep and I read and I study and I'm doing it not because I'm trying to impress somebody or not that I'm trying to move hearts because I cannot move hearts. I cannot do it. I can change for a moment, but I can tell you God is the one who brings the growth. He's the one who brings the change. And actually, I don't know what your heart is like. I prep and I pray. I stay up every Saturday night. I pray late into night, trust in God. And this is not me saying, look at me. This is me saying, God, I trust your economy, not mine. Come on. Even if I don't see the results. Even if after I leave and people go, eh, seven out of ten. <laughs> it's not upon me. I'm here to sow. That actually my job is to sow. My job every week is to sow seed, sow seed. I apologize if that gets you in the eye. Sow seed. And let me tell you, this is the reality. As I sow, as I preach the word of God, I know that some sermons I preach, people come after us weeping going, that was unbelievable. God spoke to me. How did you know that was going on in my life? I'm like, I didn't. And they're like, that changed everything. And I've seen the fruit of repentance and God radically changed people's lives from that sermon. The same sermon. Somebody else comes and goes, yeah, not your best. Same sermon, same seed, <laughs> different response, different heart soil it's been landing on. Here's the thing, when actually we come to church, our, this, when I say we're preaching this together, we understand my job here is to sow seed. Our job as a people is to prepare the soil to receive it. This is very good. It should be more than just Brett and Shirley amening me. Because this is what the Bible goes on saying, Galatians 6 says, sow into the flesh, and you will reap into the flesh. It says, sow into the spirit, and you will reap in the spirit. The question I ask myself often is, do I want the couch, or do I want my calling? Because let me tell you, comfort and calling never, 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 ever go together. And we wanting to be able, people who sow in the flesh, but reap in the spirit, but that's not the economy of heaven. I want, to re- I want to sow towards my needs, my comforts, my ideas, my abilities. I want this, and there's nothing wrong with Netflix, nothing wrong with those things, but I'm telling you, invest in those areas. You'll reap in, in those areas. Sow into the Spirit. God says, He will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. I want to ask you today, or encourage us, to stop living off last year's harvest. I think a lot of us have lived or for years. I remember in my teenage years spending days, days. I chose university classes strategically so I'd have hours off so I could worship and pray. And that's not a boast saying, look at me. That's, I just had, I knew that God had something. I said, God, I want something. I sowed, I sowed. And I know God has been faithful. And I'm living off the fruit of that. But I felt God say, I don't want you to live off the fruit of that forever. I want you to sow seed today because I've got a bigger future for you. 
Stop living off the past. And those things are wonderful, great history. I'm so grateful for praying parents. But I pray that my, parent, my kids would have praying parents too who sowed into their future. I'll ask you another question. How much seed are you sitting on that is unsown, that is unplanted, that's unput out there? Because here's the, 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 the understanding for you now is that it doesn't work, seed doesn't work until it's in the dirt. None of the seed here is going to do anything except make the person cleaning this hall hate me a little bit more. <laughs> Nothing's going to grow here. Because a seed only works when it goes in the dirt. Because the kingdom of God, it's in the dirt. You see, seed is supposed to be in the soil, not on the shelf. And too many people of us have the seed on the shelf, but we aren't putting in the soil. Because the kingdom of God is dirty work. I want to let you into a little dirty little secret about the kingdom of God. It's dirty, and it appears little. And people, too many people miss out on that secret reality of the kingdom of God. They want the bam when he says it's in the dirt. I want to encourage us, some people here, maybe own hearts as well, sow against your disappointment. This is a season of disappointment. It feels like there's disappointments like a blanket over people's dreams, businesses, hopes, relationships. It feels like that. And I want to say this is nothing new to the scriptures. Isaiah 6 verse 13, as the script says, so Israel's stump will become a holy seed. I always mean saying that Isaiah is prophesying at a time where all the hopes and dreams of Israel have been leveled to the ground, where they feel like the great tree of the nation has been severed to a stump. And Isaiah prophesies, says, that stump will become a holy seed. And he's talking about Jesus who will come. But it's the reality for us. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a promised fulfilled is a tree of life. The promised fulfilled is a tree of life. And I want to encourage us that when we can't see the trees of God's promises, will you keep sowing seed? Because trees never start out as trees. They always start out as seeds. And so often we get dis disillusioned and we say, but I've prayed that. I've trusted for that. I've, I've tied, Gabe, and still in financial struggles. Keep sowing seed. It's a principle of the kingdom. Not a principle of church. Not a principle of get out of your mess. It's, no, it's a principle of the kingdom. This is what it's like. It's in the dirt. So I want to encourage you. Where, where's your future? Is it in the bank? In the economy? In a policy? In a job? I say, no, your future. It's in the dirt. It's in the dirt. Second point and final point, we talked about sowing. I want to tell us about reaping. The scripture, Jesus goes on, and I'd love you to go study it at home because there's so much nuance and incredible insight in there. It's simple, but it's secretive, and it's subversive. It turns everything upside down. But this reality, as Jesus says, the farmer sows the seed, seed goes in the ground, but it falls on different types of seal and you'll, uh, soil, and you'll see them, not different types of seals, sorry, <laughs> that's a different movie, different type of soil, hard ground, shallow and rocky ground, divided ground, or good soil. The hard soil is the footpath, and for time's sake, it falls on the footpath, and, says, and the, the, the seed falls there on that soil, and the birds snatch it away. That which was planted. It just falls on hard ground. And Jesus is saying that it's like falling on hearts that are hardened, that, don't, that actually just can't take root of the soil, the, the seed. The second one is the shallow or rocky ground. And this understanding says it receives it with joy, but no roots are there. There's no roots. So it sprouts up quickly, but there's no roots. So as soon as pressure comes, the, the illustration, as soon as the sun starts to shine a little bit brighter, that it scorches that what's growing and it dies. Thirdly, it says there's divided soil. Soil that is, is, is competing with weeds and, and thorns. And, and, the, and, the, and Jesus starts to say, these are the worries and lure of wealth in life. And the seed takes root and tries to grow, but the thorns of, 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 of the other things that are pulling out teens start to squash out the life that was growing there. And he finally says, there's the good soil that produces a harvest. And, and I've read this many times, and, uh, and my insight has always been that these are four different types of people. Somebody with a hard heart here today, people. Sort it out. Somebody with shallow, no roots, sort it out. Divided hearts, I want to speak to you now. And then there's some of us, you're just the good soil. It's always me. I'm that guy. I'm like, oh, those other three need to really sort out their hearts. I don't know why they're not growing. When I've realized that actually I think there's potential for all of us to be all of those four. Some of us, all of those four on the same day. People with toddlers, all of those four before 8 a.m. in the morning. It's me. <laughs> but here's the reality that I mean, with, with Benji, he's, a, he's this character, and he says funny things, and he does funny things. He wants someone to talk to us, and he's, just, he's 
uh, the self-acclaimed class clown. And, uh, and at home, he's telling things, and we all laughing, and he says something funny. He's trying to talk to me. He says something funny. And I'm like, that is brilliant. That has got to be on some, on, on, it's got to be on Instagram reel. It's got to be on something. I'm a millennial parent, so I pull out my phone. And I start from, I was like, hey, Benji, go, he's like, And Benji's got this phrase that he says that I could just complete. He says to me, no photos, just listen. <laughs> no photos, just listen. Sorry, sorry, boy. And I, and I, I think that's, the reality of how we engage with God a lot of the time. We end up, we, God is wanting to speak to us, but we are, He's speaking to us through all the filters that we have put up. He's speaking to us, a seed is being sown in our hearts, but it's going through the filters of our unrepentant sin. It's going through the filters of our offense, the filters of our bitterness, the filters of our failure, the filters of our arrogance. And I believe God would say this morning, no photos, just listen. Listen. And allow his hands past the filters into the dirt of our lives. He wants to go get in onto the dirt of our lives. You see, here's our two jobs, and this is where I'm bringing this to land uh, shortly. It's two jobs. Is number one, if you want to know what do I do, if you're feeling what do I do in the season, there's so much other things clamoring for my attention. Here's what you do: keep sowing. Number two, keep the soil of your heart soft towards God and His people. If you do those two things, welcome to the kingdom of God. You will grow you'll find life. Keep sowing, keep your heart soft. You see, this is warfare, spiritual warfare 101. This is the kingdom of God. It's in the dirt. I wish I could tell you, I would tell you spiritual warfare, let's march around, let's plead the blood, all those things have their place, but I'm telling you, most people just need to sow and keep their heart soft. If you do that, you will see the kingdom of God advancing your life like you've never seen it before. Keep sowing, keep your heart soft. It's in the dirt. I ask you, what is the condition of your heart? Now, you're self ordered. Is it right now? Is it hard? Is it shallow? Is it divided? And, and, and if you say, yeah, I'm feeling, I feel like I, I want more of God, but it's just, I'm struggling for the root, word of God to take root in my heart. I'm struggling for God's, to hear God's voice in this moment. Make it a big deal then. Don't leave here saying, yeah, my heart is, I've, I've got stuff, but I'll work it out. No, listen. Listen to what God is saying. I think too much of the church, we go, we respond, and I'm guilty. Altar calls and moments come say, who wants to step up? Yeah, I would have prayed for that. Yeah, I think that's okay. No, this is the kingdom of God. Enter into it. So listen, he has ears, listen. So I want to tell you, sowing and reaping, the economy of heaven, we can't make anything grow. If you realize in that reality, sowing, we just sow seed. And then we stand on the other side, we respond with soft hearts to receive the word, to receive what God is doing. But we can't do anything in the middle process. You see, this is the reality. When I read this many times, I, I often mistakenly thought that Jesus alluded to the fact that God was the farmer sowing the seed in this illustration. But if you read that in the scripture, Jesus does not articulate that fact. And in Mark's gospel account of this, he goes to an extent to say, the farmer does not know how this whole process works. Let me tell God knows how the process works. So I want to suggest to you that actually if you want to know that we are the farmers who sow seed and we are the soil who receive seed because it's the sowing and reaping principle, Jesus is the seed. He is the word. He is the seed that is sown in the story. And this is a reminder for my fickle heart to keep reminding myself and beat into this unbelieving heart that wants to become hardened and shallow and divided again and again and again is to say that I am not the source even this principle of sowing and reaping is not some cosmic karma. If I do this, then that will happen. No, no, no. I am banking on the seed that will do its work. Not my ability. The seed will do its work. You see, when Jesus starts saying parables of the kingdom, he's not telling small stories about us. Apply this and see how this works. No, he's telling big stories about him. This is all about Jesus. Isaiah 55, verse 10 to 11 says this. The rain and snow come down from heavens. And stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always, always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to. And it will prosper everywhere I send it. This is the incredible reality. As the whole Bible starts out in Genesis 1 with a farmer, with the creator God bending over into the dirt of humanity. His hands start, the whole story of his relation, the kingdom of God coming to earth in Genesis 1 starts where? In the dirt. It's in the dirt, people. Should have taken a clue on page one. 
It's in the dirt. And his hands lifting humanity out of the dirt. And then when Jesus comes, we fast forward the story past Matthew 13. They get so riled up that they crucify Jesus. The, 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 the love of heaven come to earth. The kingdom of God come to earth. And humanity, humanity buries Jesus in the dirt. Full circle. And John 12 verse 24 says, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And see, this scripture was talking about what Jesus was doing, because I want to tell you today, in that moment, in the economy of earth, it looked like we had buried Jesus, buried the kingdom of God, buried it deep. When actually I realized from the economy of heaven, Jesus was sown as a seed into the earth. He wasn't just buried, he was sown. By faith he went to the cross for the joy set before him, knowing that that was not the end, that actually if I remain alone, I abide alone. But if I'm sown, if I fall to the ground and die, I'll produce a harvest. And this is an incredible reality. When Jesus goes into the ground on the Friday, we know it's Friday. But as I started, I said, it's Friday. And there's tears of pain and anguish, but it's Friday. But Sunday is coming. But Sunday is coming. I would love to call the band up because I want to tell you the harvest is coming. The health goes. The pain goes. Disaster strikes. Let me remind you, maybe just for two people here, the word will accomplish what it was set forth to do. Maybe you're sitting here with a diagnosis, a pain, a relationship failure, and you're wondering, where is all that seed I've sown? The word will accomplish what it was sent out to do. Maybe you're sitting here and your marriage has failed and you're going, God, where were you? The word will accomplish what it was sent out to do. Do not give up on the seed. This is the reality. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, my life right now, it's in the dirt. Let me encourage you, hold onto that seed because that's where the kingdom of God begins. You see, this is the question I can imagine as we bring this into land. Is all the people gathering around Jesus in that moment and Jesus starts to say, the kingdom of God is light? I can imagine him going to ask him the question, have you come to overthrow Rome? And Jesus would say, no, I've come to overthrow hell. God is on a bigger agenda than our agendas. He's higher than our politics. He's higher than our economies. The, the kingdoms of, our, of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. We're inheriting a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It is not of this world. It's not, it's not one day when, high in the sky theology. No, it's here and now in the dirt. And we're living between the times, knowing it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. And the people of God are people who know that we'll keep, until then, we'll keep sowing and we'll keep our hearts soft. We'll keep sowing, we'll keep our hearts soft, and we'll see the harvest of the Lord. Why don't we stand to our feet? The kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like a farmer, seed and soil. It's in the dirt. And I believe the only appropriate response now is to, in a sense, throw up our hands, throw up our lives, open the soil of our heart and say, Father, would you come and soften my heart so I can receive your word, so I can receive what the Spirit of God is saying at this time. Offer him the dirt. Offer him the things that you feel are of no substance. Offer him the things that's chaos. Offer him the things that are complex. Offer him the questions, the queries, the insecurities, the deficiencies where you say, I am not enough. Allow the kingdom of God to come in because it's subversive. It says the weak shall be made strong. The hungry shall be filled. The humble shall be exalted. The kingdom of God says the least shall become the greatest. The last shall become the first. Those who are in will find themselves out. Those who are on the outside will shall become in. It's the upside down nature of the kingdom. It's simple for little children to understand. And yet it's secretive. It's only for those who have ears to hear. Will you listen to what God is saying? The kingdom of God, it's in the dirt. And His Father's hands want to come into our lives right now and till the soil, till the soil of our heart. Open up disappointment ears and say, will you sow seed again? Why don't we lift up our hands? My hands are lifted. I need to understand the economy of heaven more than ever before, the economy of sowing and reaping. My heart that wants buying and selling, that wants hustling and maneuvering, that wants, wants posturing and, and, and narrating my own story and trying to come on the right side of things, but saying, no, God, I want to enter into your kingdom like a child, sowing and reaping. So I pray this prayer over my friends and my heart. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth, in our dirt, as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Why don't you pray that? Say, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That was an amazing sermon. 
if you would like to find out what your next step is, why don't you go to our website, lifechanges.org.za or follow us on social media to find out about what is happening in the life of our church. Life Changes Church, we love you. Have an amazing, amazing week.